it's like post San Antonio where the Rio Grande. Peter wasn't real happy with the choice because he's tired of hearing about women's education. <laughs> and, but that isn't what the whole book is. I'm going to do Sabbath School this morning. And you can see on the screen that this is the book we've chosen for this summer. It's by our own William Johnson with two S's. So if you can't remember anything else, put that in. I looked up Bill Johnson with one S and couldn't find anything. Uh, and this is, comes up. Um, where are we headed? Adventism after San Antonio. In June, and it goes, there's 10 chapters, so we'll go through September. And uh, it's only $12.95 for a paperback on Amazon and even cheaper for Kindle if that's what you're after. Uh, this week and next week, um, Graham Stacy is going to be talking to us, and he started out his, I don't want to say his life, because he started his life as a baby, but he started out his career as a, as a pastor, and he's a psychologist, but not in the, the School of Behavioral Health, but the School of Dentistry. <laughs> he's the Associate Dean for Admissions and Student Affairs there in Dentistry, and um, he says, trust me, that degree is used all the time, the pastoral and the, the one in psychology. So we'll let him uh, introduce his talk today. Okay. <coughs> Good work. Um, thank you. Nice to be here. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll sort of defer to the left here. I don't know whether there's any significance in that, but we're nice to have a few here counterbalancing. Um, nice to see you. Um, let's pray. God of grace, thank you for a, another day, another Sabbath, that we can come and share some time together, share our ideas, our lives, and uh, in the context of worship. Thank you for all those things, and uh, we pray a blessing upon our time. In Jesus' name, amen. Um, I wanted to uh, just start off um, with... Uh, a, a thank you. Uh, I don't know what it's like for the rest of you, uh, and I think I heard, uh, I think a, a student was referenced for this point, but I'll, I'll claim it as well, that um, this Sabbath morning uh, exercise here is like my indulgence. You know, um, sometimes Roseanne asks me when I come home, what, what did you do today? I, I choose not to tell her on most occasions because um, and think of the, uh, the sort of um, paradox of all of this, but I'm either putting out fires or starting them, you know. So, and uh, I'm sure Henry uh, has similar experiences. Uh, and I worked out a couple of weeks ago that uh, on, a, on a bad week, I can run so far and so fast that uh, I might have one and a half to two hours in the week that I would call my own to either just think about something or do something. I, I can see a few other heads sort of nodding and it's probably just as bad. So this is my indulgence. So thank you to, to Dave, and, and of course in the memory of Roy and Laura, and now I've started I shouldn't have, and Alan and all those that make this work, um, that we can spend a little time together. Um, my, um, my plan today, is that I'm just going to review very briefly, um, with no authority but with some interest, um, how, how the doctrine of inspiration works. And we've got more qualified people here. Uh, I'm reminded, uh, I remind myself that I'm an untrained theologian, maybe a little too enthusiastic for my own good, but I enjoy thinking about things. Um, I'd like to then introduce a theoretical perspective from a completely unrelated discipline. And, and I'm sure that as I get started, you'll go, what? Where? Anyway, uh, bear with me for 10 or minutes or so, and I'll try and bring them back together. And then I'd like to try and make the connections uh, that help me understand the, uh, the scripture as sacred text. And then uh, maybe next week I'll, I'll apply some of that to sort of a contemporary model. Um, I, I enjoy trying to think of difficult things probably that I'm unqualified to deal with somewhat and, and get metaphors or word pictures or images from other fields that help me understand somewhat. And so forgive me for that. Um, uh, I'm 
but, but it helps me along the way. So, oh, I couldn't help sort of referencing one of my, my favorite, H.L. Uh, Mencken, for every complex problem there's an answer that is clear, simple, and wrong, he said. <laughs> uh, he got it from somebody else, and I understand the original, uh, that is, there is always an easy solution to every human problem, neat, plausible, wrong. I think if I was stealing it and putting one in there, I'd put, for every complex problem, there is an answer that is clear, simple, and incomplete, at least. Uh, but anyway, this is a chill mink, and, and uh, it's not for the fate hunted to read some of the things that he has written. Um, I'm sorry, my computer's out a little bit with this, but I'll, I mean, I don't think we'll miss too much here. Uh, Second Timothy is where <coughs> it sort of sits for us. And whichever version you use, all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be made perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And just as an aside, I, I always find it interesting on this topic that while many of the scriptural writers claim and, and sort of preface their work that uh, God had spoken to them and they were writing it down, there aren't many texts, in fact, I think it's probably true that this is probably the one. I mean, it's a very fundamental doctrine that we base on one text of, of you know, what it means. I'm sure there, there's other inferences about it, but uh, it's what you make of this text as to uh, what all of this means uh, going forward. Um, I, can re I can remember, it shows you I've still got some faculties left. I can remember being at Avondale College. It's now um, 50 years ago that I started, so that's a bit scary all in itself. But I can remember sitting as a young uh, theology student at Avondale and uh, a particular evangelist had a, had a guest lecture. And the moment I tell this story, um, Barry Taylor and a few others will pick out who the evangelist is. But, but he was very influential in Australia in the 60s and 70s and so on. And uh, as an impressionable, naive, 18-something-year-old, 20-year-old, I don't know where it was, what year, I was sitting in this class, and he thundered as only he could thunder from the pulpit that his confidence that the heavenly sanctuary was indeed literal and the badger skins were all up there and the gopher woods and so on because the Bible clearly said it and um, I wasn't, I was probably naive but I'm naive in a different way now. I would just probably challenge him on that but, uh, but that was very certain for him. Uh, because the Bible <coughs> said it. And so, well, that matters not uh, too much in the great scheme of the human experience. Although, if I remember correctly, some of the saints were sorted out for not fitting in with that sort of particular view. So it did have some consequences, but I can remember him being very certain about that. Um, more contemporary issues are probably more vital. Um, you know, our talking about, our thinking about, our inclusion of, and you know, I pause there because you've got to get the right words, um, about LGBTQ issues. Um, they're all very real and uh, I, I, I must confess, uh, when I find simplistic answers to complex problems, and you can roll a text out any way you like, or some text. Um, those those use of scripture have very human <coughs> consequences. They're very powerful. Uh, they're very meaningful. It's not casual. It's not a game. Um, and I'm not going to talk about it today, but I was interested to read the statement of, of the church on transgenderism and wonder why they bothered, to be quite honest. Why get into that when you really have nothing to say on the topic? Uh, talk about social issues or how it might make a difference. But these things are very powerful, uh, very important. Um, and these more contemporary issues are, are fairly important. Um, 
I'm not going to say that I'm the expert on this, but I read a little bit about, you know, the, the range of views about inspiration stretch from one side that is more traditional and orthodox, that, that the scriptures that we've got are simply superintended, it's not my word, I read it somewhere over the week, um, by the Holy Spirit. And the views range from uh, dictation. I think we've probably moved past that one, that God somehow dictated the actual words. Uh, even as a young guy, I felt that not a very compelling argument. That, I mean, English hadn't been in, uh, uh, even in discovered, and somehow God was dictating so that we got English. Uh, uh, even Latin wasn't even discovered when most of it came down. So, I didn't find that too compelling. Um, verbal plenary inspiration, you know, that um, a role is given to the writers, um, but, but God is protecting the integrity of the words. Dynamic inspiration, um, thoughts were inspired, but the words were left to others, etc. So it sort of stretches from that, and my trained theological theologian colleagues could probably expand that much better than me, but that's sort of it, I think. Absolute truth, no trace of error or relativity, the inspired person under the control of supernatural influence, inhibited in the use of normal faculties, sort of thing, that God is in control of this, this process. Uh, again, uh, I don't know all there is to know about more neo-orthodox models, but um, scripture is the word of God, but not the words of God. Um, it's very interesting to me, I, I often watch with interest how we, how we take words and just ever so slightly just nudge them, and they take on a completely different meaning. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, Roseanne and I took time after we, while we were visiting Andrews, uh, we went up the road to Battle Creek, never been. So that was a good experience to go and see the little village. And if you've never been, it's a good, it's a good experience um, to go and see where the saints were. And you come over the hill and see the, the great uh, edifice of the hospital. And you can see how all of that sort of all came together. And I noticed as the guides were showing us around that they were, they were pretty careful about uh, talking about the fact that uh, our prophet, Ellen White, had had a vision here in this particular room. But every now and then, uh, it sort of slipped a little bit, and on one or two occasions, the guy talked about the vision of Ellen White got us to this point. And I thought, that's, that's good, that's sort of subtle. It sort of changes it a little bit. As I go around the colleges, I'm always intrigued by the fact, you'll see the banners, La Sierra, other places, about the mission of the school. Well, 50 years ago, we used that word quite differently. The mission meant evangelism for the Adventist church, and now they've kept the word, but just sort of nudged it a little bit to broaden it out, and so you can have a completely different meaning. That's okay. Um, in this particular, um, the more progressive thing, um, it's the medium of revelation. God speaks through redemptive history, and he, Jesus, speaks now as we well, as we, uh, and God speaks as we encounter Jesus. Uh, scripture, for some more, even to the more left, uh, doesn't need to be objective truth. Revelation depends on the experience, the personal interpretation of each individual, and the details of Scripture is not as important as the account of, the account of Jesus. And you've heard all of those things. You're, you're familiar with that, I know. that That's sort of the range of ways people go about saying, how is this... Book, um, speaking to me. Um, what is the authority? How do I relate to it? And you probably have got it worked out. I, I admit, I might be the outlier here and the only one who wanders around the, the backyard on a Friday evening thinking, now what is that? How does that work? What does that mean? How does God speak? Probably heightened a little bit by the fact that I've I've got my foot in two different worlds uh, that I, I love the interplay. You know? um, once when I was uh, talking to some friends that I was a pastor and that I was a psychologist, the response back to me was that, well, you really have got one foot in heaven and one in hell. 
and, and I said, yeah, but which is which? Is the question. Um, so, you know, uh, six days a week, uh, I must sort of think scientifically, and the seventh, I like to still think scientifically, um, but those sort of two worlds, um, they don't always talk to each other. Thankfully, and that's another thing that I like, thankfully we come to a university and we have this environment where we all sit in the room together and we do speak with each other, which is great. Um, so, how do we, how does it go? So, so here's sort of where I was, sort of midweek, I guess. Um, I confess to you, um, I have become more concerned with top-down. That, that God is somehow in control of this. I know this is probably not where you are, but um, while I see many good things about top-down, um, there are positives. Um, forgive me, but, but the circular argument um, is, is not, doesn't help me as much these days. You know, the assumption that the Bible is inspired and the way you prove that the Bible is inspired by reading the Bible um, leaves me a little bit sort of, hmm. So when those people tell me that they were sure that God inspired them, I think, how did they know that? And I remember that that was the same group of people that thought that dreams probably came from God and that lightning did and earthquakes did and disease did as well. And so I think, did they really know? And without being too, I'm not trying to be flippant, but, but I, I, I wouldn't want my dreams sort of read out as somehow a communication from God. Um, nor do you, you can't remember most of them, thankfully, because they're not locked into long-term memory, but um, I don't think we want to go there. So, I know there are positives from the top down, the security, the certainty, the authority, the objectiveness that comes with saying, God has spoken. I confess to you that I've, I've even become a little uncomfortable about saying God's word. I, I long ago I gave up the words of God because you know all of the issues and I don't think any of us are at that spot um, they are the words of scripture and I do think that they are inspired and I'll get around to that um, but I have concerns um, the, the, the idea that God spoke in the scripture can be used for a lot of good probably more good than bad, but it can be used for some bad as well. Intolerance, rigidity, uh, my phrase, moral inertia. You know, the people stop thinking about issues when, well, God said, you know, it's, it's sort of a more elevated version of what Ellen said, Ellen might said, therefore we stop. And I find that troubling in a community of faith. So, uh, but I'm not, I'm not at all comfortable with an entirely bottom-up either. It's just everybody, it doesn't matter what, um, you know, there are billions of different this or that or whatever. I, I think that loses something for me as well, um, that it's just a human invention, only little value to future. And, you know, um, you know ov obviously relativism comes into it, and, um, and that's a nasty thought. So, what do I do? Um, so, these are my sort of practical things. So, what do I do with it all? Is God involved? If he's involved, in what way? Should I form, let the scripture inform my moral life? And I've decided I should, but, you know, they're the sort of questions that I had. Um, many claim to write on behalf of God. How did they know that? Um, and, and what criteria do I use to eliminate some and include others? Uh, interestingly, when I was just checking some of my things through the week, uh, some of the early, the early church fathers referred to a lot of the work that didn't get into the canon as inspired. So how do they get on with that? Um, could scripture be nothing more than a human invention? You know, the, 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 the rank sociologist would say, well, 
you know, it's just people musing about there for it. Um, I'm not sure that that sort of does it for me. Um, uh, it looks like I should have edited a little bit of down near the bottom, but uh, well, what do I do when when issues and answers that I'm given, like my my uh, paper on transgenderism, just don't have any don't have sufficient connection with reality as we understand, you know, when we use other sources of information. And then you're forced to this, you know, that somehow transgenderism is a sin. Right. You know? It's biology and surgery and psychology that that's involved there. Anyway. Um, so and if it gets too hard, why bother? Now thankfully you haven't got to that point, nor have I, so the fact that it does engage us, we come along and we talk some more. So let me introduce you to um, uh, Paul Baltes, um, 1939 to 2006, a little bit of his, his background. Psychologist, sorry, but that's the sort of people I deal with, so uh, I understand him. Um, he spent most of his professional career talking about lifespan development. All I want to do today is, this is not a lecture about lifespan development, but I'd like to share as briefly as I can uh, how he put his ideas together, and I want you to just take on board the words. Here's my little plane with words from another place. All right, Take on his words that he used to explain lifespan uh, development. Um, I was going to bring you along a handout, but the, the best one I could find was from Wikipedia. I knew you were more professional than that, so I thought, oh my goodness, this, it, 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 it's in every lifespan development textbook, but I didn't bring that along because I, I thought uh, that would be too tricky. Um, the first word is lifespan development. Just get in board lifespan development. And the idea behind this is that well, you can read some of the key points. From birth to death, all stages of life can contribute in the regulation of human. No time holds supremacy. So as opposed to the, the theorists that were talking about uh, development being sort of step by step and stages, you know, you're a little kid, you're a bigger kid, you're an adolescent, you're a teen, you're whatever. He said, no, you've got to take it all into account and that everything has an impact. We move through life and the challenges, opportunities and situations give direction, force and substance to our development. All right, so you got that one? Just life long development. It never stops, okay? Diverse patterns are the a couple of key words. Um, there's another word up the top, my, forgive me, I will have to go over and adjust my computer in the future. It's called multi-dimensionality and multi-directionality. Um, according to Bolt, uh, that there, there's a, com uh, a complex interaction of factors uh, that determine how life goes. Um, you know, heredity and experience and, and all sorts of other things in between, all interplay. That there's no way that you can just say it's going to go from here to here to here to here. It's complex. Lifespan development does not occur in a strictly linear fashion that increases uh, functional efficacy. It has the capacity to improve or decline as, as life goes on. Um, as opposed to those theorists that talked about lifespan being just sort of one step you know, upward and onward, etc. Um, and and there's, there's a I will watch the time here. This may be a little bit long. This is the longest one I'll read, but um, as an illustration of this, let me just read this. The developmental process occurring between childhood and adolescence, known as puberty, illustrates Baldi's principle of multidimensionality and multidirectionality. Puberty is described as a period of rapid morphological body changes, including physical growth and hormonal changes, as well as a myriad of psychological and social contextual changes. The types of changes associated with puberty include the development of primary and secondary sex characteristics, alterations in height and weight, fluctuations in hormonal levels, along with several other changes. Psychological changes during adolescence involve a broad range of experiences, 
individuals and encounter over this period, including the development of cognitive faculties such as abstraction and other adult cognitive processes, new emotions along with psychological changes. The fact that the term puberty encompasses such a broad domain illustrates this multi-dimensionality, he says. A um, couple, couple of other sentences. Um, over the course of puberty, neuronal changes attempt to deal with this unregulated behaviour by increasing one's ability to regulate emotions and impulses. Inversely, the ability for adolescents to engage in spontaneous activity and creativity, both domains commonly associated with impulse behaviour, decrease over the adolescent period in responses to changes, etc. So he's just making the point, all of these things, you know, they're interacting. Um, uh, several domains uh, are involved. Let me speed through here a little bit. Development is gain or loss. This is sort of an extension of that thought. Lifespan is influenced by joint expression of gain and loss. The gain and loss of parallel processes. Individuals develop within the framework of this dynamic. Individuals may sacrifice one function for the specialization and improved efficacy of other models. And, and he makes the point again that adolescents in, in their development may, may, uh, may have to sacrifice that creativity and spontaneousness that they know in order to make better choices, etc. So there's this, you gain something, you lose something in, in this process of um, development. Another word, there's only seven by the way, not 24 or 28, plasticity. Plasticity speaks to interpersonal variability and focus on potentialities and limits. There may be potential development outcomes that are much more open and pluralistic than allowed for in stage development explanations. And the example, he, there's no single pathway, says, for individual development. Right? Hang on to that thought. There's no single pathway um, across the lifespan. And he gives an example, I won't read the quote, neuronal plasticity or the capacity of the brain to adapt to new requirements. We've learned over the last 20 or 30 years how marvellous that is and that uh, people who have visual problems, some of the other senses take over and, and, and sort of adapt. And, and so he's again making the point that of, in the word plasticity. Historical embeddedness. Um, this, in, for Baldi's, this thought says, uh, development operates within social, socio-cultural context. And he gives lots of examples, of course. And the example I'm going to give you is my dad. Uh, Baldi's would even suggest that something as pretty individualized as personality can be altered by the context in which we live. All right? Something... Uh, that we would think would be not changeable that much. Now, my dad, if you'd known him, um, he's passed away for five, six years now, but um, towards the end of it, I may have used this illustration, my forgiveness, uh, I, I ask forgiveness. My dad, I, towards the end of his life, I could not take him to a restaurant. Because as his filters went down, uh, my dad in a restaurant would mutter loudly. My dad was not a quiet mutterer. He was a loud mutterer. So he would mutter um, <laughs> um, about when people left food on their plates, it offended him. His person, he was, uh, the, the, the words we would use without reference to his context were stingy you know, rigid, whatever, but he was a child of the Depression. He knew what it was to get food. He knew that his family would go down to the butcher shop, for him they would have them, but they would go down and they would buy a sheep's head at the end of the week, because no one wanted a sheep's head. And they would take it home and they would boil it and peel off bits of, of meat and that was their protein. He knew that you would then scrape the fat off the top of the cooking pot and compress it and put a bit of salt with it. And that was the substitute for butter. He knew the depression. And his, his personality was influenced by um, 
this historical embeddedness of where he was in time and how he grew up. And it was a little tricky being, you know, the kid of the 50s and 60s when you've got a father who's a child of the Depression, but you sort of understand that a little bit there to show that intelligence can be influenced by, by the environment. Uh, and, and the other experiences of life that go on. It's, it's not just genetics, it's just not biology there. So here again, this, this, uh, this uh, contextualism is a paradigm. He talked about three systems of biological environmental influence, almost done. Age-graded, history-graded, non-normative. And, and you and I know that, uh, that you know, those of us who are teachers, we know that there are cohort differences between those who are trying to do the teaching now and our students. Uh, we're not millennials, they're wired differently. Uh, I'm a child of the Vietnam era. Now, while I didn't go to Vietnam, all of that stuff was happening when I was at college. And if you thought you had it over here, we had it over there as well. So pushing against authority, all of this sort of stuff, maybe that's had more influence on me than I realized. So cohort differences, uh, history graded differences, you know, the differences between cohorts and what I've already said, you understand that, you know, uh, baby boomer teachers dealing with millennials have to do some mental adjustments as they go along because it's a different mindset. Um, not putting them down, I'm just saying it's different. Uh, we know it's different. They see the world differently. Non-normative. Baldies would say, look, you've got to take into account that these different <coughs> events in life can profoundly affect the development of, a, of an individual. For example, a 13-year-old giving birth to a child profoundly influences that child and the parent and probably the next generation and the family out of which, in, in which the 13-year-old is still situated. So, he would say, you can't ignore all of these things when you're talking about development. All right. uh, development is multidisciplinary. It's hidden up the top there. Bodies would say, you've got to sit down and you've got to listen to all of the disciplines. No one discipline gets a mortgage on truth. That was not his words, they're mine. No one discipline has, has this all captured. So the different disciplines delineate the mechanisms involved. And we need to have everybody at the table to understand the complexities of development. And so he would say, and of course you'd expect me to put psychology first, but you know, psychology, philosophy, theology, sociology, anthropology, all of the disciplines, um, biology, you know, all of that that goes with that all need to be listened to. Now, I'm going to take you into an uncomfortable spot at the moment. He would say equally in that. Everybody has something to contribute. No one is the gatekeeper in understanding human development. So, again, let me catch up with, you know, what, what notes I scrabbled out here. So, so back to my unfinished, that's on the top of this slide, and incomplete understanding of inspiration. I'm going to, and then I'll, I'll stop in a few minutes. I find the traditional top-down breathed into, it was very fascinating to read, you know, Jerome, and again, what, what you know, uh, in, inspiration meaning that we are, that God breathed into these people or whatever. Um, so I thought, oh, I'll just capture that little thought. Um, I, I find the top-down breathed into explanation difficult. You may have worked it out. I find it difficult. I don't know what it means. I don't know how it works. I see a lot of variation. I see a lot of misuse of that concept. If God was in control of all of that stuff, how do we get such ugly stuff in there? And there's, there's better explanations of what I just said fairly quickly there. Um, but I find the idea that somehow that, that God was doing the breathing into um, uh, a little bit, that's difficult for me. You might have worked it out. I understand the arguments for it, 
divine authority, security, certainty. You know, we rally around the scripture because God has said it. I understand that. I see challenges, as I've mentioned before, rigidity, intolerance, moral inertia. Um, when, and, and just sort of anecdotally, when I hear, even in 2017, what some people claim God has said that they should think about other people in 2017, based on you know some obscure text or some simple reading, I think, that doesn't sound very inspired to me. Um, and if it is, then it opens up for me um, a whole other set of questions in explaining theodicy and then explaining the nature of God and why he would do and say and whatever. Um, all right. Bottom-up explanations breathed in are more consistent with the evidence. I'm not saying I embrace it entirely, but... You know, it seems to be that people who wrote the scriptures to me, let me just play with the idea of inspired, you know, oh, inspired, God inspired. I know it's not what you read when you read Second Timothy, but when I when I think about it, I think I think I can see those people inspired by God. Inspired by their notions of God, by their experience of, by their understanding of, by what their worldview allows them to see. I think I can see those people saying, God, is this what it means? And writing it down. I know that doesn't satisfy if you want it to be objective, and, you know, you're the humble instrument, etc. But it makes sense to me that it could work that way. On the other hand, scripture to me is sacred text. I would read some of it somewhere, class, devotional, you know, recreational reading sometime. I mean, it's not the book I carry around in my job every day, but I have one sitting there and I often read it with students and so on. Where holy men and women wrote of their understanding of the nature and workings of God. Here's, here's the, the, the clincher for me. Thousands of years of studying, of telling, retelling, understanding, reframing, applying scripture, going to Sabbath school classes, listening to sermons, reading books, debating, dialoguing, adjusting one's thinking, is a precious and strong heritage on which to base a Bible framework. My engagement with scripture is where I come to participate in that process. Okay. Some help from Bowles. I'll do this real quick. So here's these words. I'm just now throwing them in. All right? And I'm going to stretch these metaphors too far. Forgive me. Correct me. But here's some words. Multidisciplinary. Theology, psychology, sociology, biology, the whole lot. Earth sciences. And not competitors. All appeal or speak to the human experience. All are incomplete. None are predominant. Um, and I'll go back to my thing about the statement on transgenderism. I find it troubling that, that almost all of the science would be somehow stepped aside. And, and you theologically frame it and say, these people have got to fit into this model, and it doesn't fit. And therefore, it, for me, it does damage. All are incomplete. I'm sorry to my colleagues who do theology. You know that your discipline is incomplete. That's why you keep studying and keep sharing and keep growing and keep helping us along. And we need you. Um, and, and the people on this campus do listen to the scientists and we integrate and we think and we grow together. Um, I, I'm not sure that happens everywhere, but it does here. Contextualism is not relativism. Different times, ages, circumstances demand nuanced interpretations due to these forces. I don't find considering contextualism as I think about when I read scripture and anything to say that somehow I'm being relative. That's just embracing the evidence as it comes down. Historical embeddedness. Scripture is historically situated and can only and honestly be evaluated and understood in that context, period. I'm sort of wearying at the time of sort of saying, well, we can't consider history. The principles, you've, I've shared this before in my musings, 
I think the principles are eternal. The applications of those principles need all of us around the table. Plasticity, rightly used scripture, is not the gatekeeper paradigm of understanding. It does not answer some questions. Other disciplines assume the authority on those sort of questions. I should not be forced... Yeah, let me leave. I've gone too long. So gain and loss. There is the potential for progress or decline. I need to be mindful and alert to the possibility of either or both. Scripture can be used for evil as easily as it can be used for good. And I've got to be aware of that in my discussions. I've got to be disciplining myself. Um, I've got to be uh, able to challenge when I see that it doesn't quite fit. All the time knowing that my thinking is not the final word on this either. My grandchildren will inform me and say, Pa, how could you have thought such nonsense? All right? I understand that. Uh, multi-directionality. I read. Um, it, it, it's not static. Time, circumstance, new information will require reframing or abandoning previously held explanations. And lifelong. The moral principles of scripture are well tested and tried. Thousands of years of discussion and application have refined our legacy of, of understanding. Are we finished? No. There will never be a time when all the questions are answered and the process uh, is, that is no, no longer required. That's the, the magic and the beauty of church, of experiences like this. Of being able to say, we, we don't know all this. Let's stay together. Let's talk. Let's listen. Let's reflect. Let's abandon some ideas. Let's take on some new ones, etc. All right, I'm back to the text and I'm stop. I wish you weren't the first one, but go ahead. Go ahead. Well, I wonder if he applies this to groups. I gather that, as I, uh, my impression was this is a lifespan uh, development for an individual. Could that be applied to a group? And if it's applied to a group, could it be applied to the church? So one could see the denomination as a whole, or maybe Christianity as a whole, whole. while well, moving through these stages. I would have been hesitant if one thought that the stages were always progressive. No. But as I listen to this theory, there can be pushbacks and left and right, and it's not a smooth progression. Exactly. Um, Actually, Bolles has made, let me, let me have a go at both of them. Bolles has made his contribution because he said, I understand, you know, and physical development of the child and, you know, steps, you know, whatever is fairly uh, predictive, you know, whatever. But he said, please, at least include my stuff in a chapter on lifespan development because it's more dynamic. Um, it's, it, it can be, there can be multi-tracks. There can be, everything has uh, the potential to be um, uh, taken in different directions. Um, and uh, now I'm just thinking, well, I'll, I'll use this one. Um, the indigenous people of Australia, the Aboriginals sometimes called indigenous people, here they live, uh, many of them live in a particular experience. Um, I think that there is some metabolic stuff about the way they process alcohol so that they are more susceptible to alcoholism. I think that's true. Um, Plus, they've had some generations of gasoline sniffing, where many of them live, you know, which destroys their neurological functioning. So to sort of say, oh yeah, they'll all just sort of step through life, and, you know, um, is sort of naive. Um, their lives are, are different. And yes, you're right, Baldies did talk about individual, but I like the thought that um, well, he didn't completely limit it, uh, limit it to, um, because the influences were all often group related, you know, living in context, living in history, living in cohort, all of that. Um, but I think you could apply it to say, may, maybe the lifespan of an organization, which we probably need to think through a little bit, could be influenced by similar things. It makes sense. And, and reacts and adapts to these circumstances just as individual life would. Could I just follow up just for yeah. a second? 
the, the standard approach is a sociological one, right? Mm -hmm. You begin as a sect, and then you move through a church, and mm -hmm. then you become a, you know, a, a sort of an inevitability that as the group succeeds, it will lose, lose its soul yeah. along yeah. the way. Uh, but this seems like I it's a much more complex reading of the situation. I, I would think it's much more complex than that. I mean, that, that is the tradition. Sociology of religion, you read that, and that's the way they explain it would go. I think it's much more complex, and I think there can be, which is both good and bad, I think there can be progress and regression. There can be disappointment that we stumble, but picking it up again and review. I don't think the inevitability needs to say that, because I think some people, some of us too get trapped in, I can't see where the church is going, I'm paralyzed, I'll hang out for a little bit, but I can't be enthusiastic about inviting my children or my grandchildren, therefore, you know, but I say no, no. The infusion of another point, perspective, dynamic energy, can, can change all around, that around, I think. A couple more? Leo. It, it seems clear you've wrestled with the authority of Scripture, all of us have. Um, I'm sure you, you're familiar with the West Brain quadrilateral. Right? Well, so Dave that reminds me regularly that I should be more awesome. familiar with it. We're both massive fans. Of well, there you go. I mean, everyone oh. has ev everyone has a pathology, and you've just identified <laughs> you've just identified yours. There's, so, there's there's medication and special groups for that. Yeah, uh, come on. Finishing this wonderful resource that the Methodists have come up with. Awesome. And I think, let's just take, for instance, the LGBTQ issue. They say you need to examine it through these four foci, right? You've got to look at scripture, right? The texts. And the Methodists are clear that scripture has the ultimate authority. But there are other sources of authority that a Christian ought to also consider. And for them, in addition to scripture, of course, there's tradition. How has the church interpreted this issue through the years? Sure. And then it comes to reason and experience. And so let's take again back to the lesbian issue. When you look at the issue of experience, for example, we have now evidence of, of both men and women in intimate, committed relationships that are long-term. And then you look at reason, the scientific data coming out, you know, is much better than some of us. It suggests quite strongly that there's a biological component to it. And so however one understands this issue, you've got to look at those four aspects and wrestle with it uh, in order to come out with a, I think, compassionate response to the issue. Fair enough. Uh, and I think that's that's a good way to sort of, I don't think that's at variance with sort of some of those thoughts too, bringing in the others who might have something to say on those particular topics. Yeah. Peter. Thank you, Graham, for your challenge in musings. <laughs> um, two things. <coughs> In the video that they put in uh, relation with your presentation today, I found uh, uh, a quotation from Théard du Chardin that caught my attention. And uh, I want to hear your uh, opinion about this. He said that we are not uh, human beings de uh, dealing with spiritual things. We are spiritual beings dealing with human things. And the second thing that uh, I like your opinion is uh, in what category would we include the book of Ezekiel? In this book, in every chapter, Ezekiel is mentioning the word of the Lord came to me in the uh, fifth month, uh, the second day of the month, and told me, the Son of Man, go to the Israelites and tell them, because you have forgotten my commandments or you are going to suffer destruction, you are going to move to another country or go to uh, prophesy against Tyre and say, well, you set up your, uh, your place in the middle of the sea and so forth and so on. How, how, in what category would you include this uh, book? Um, what category of inspiration? Um, I'd like others to sort of join in um, with that. Um, I don't doubt it. I just 
don't know how it works. Um, I, I'm not saying he's dishonest. Um, I'm not saying he's of the devil. I just don't know how that works. Um, and when I get um, lots of people claiming similar but saying very different things, then it says to me, may maybe it wasn't quite like that. I don't know. That's how I would do that. Um, I just don't know how it goes. I think coming back to sort of where I finished here is that I think that's why we go on the journey, you know, trying to understand um, how this all operates. <coughs> I, I, it might be uncomfortable for some, but I've given myself permission to think about these things and say, and I don't, I try and avoid using the word wrong, you know, because that sets everybody off on a, you know, it can't deal with the word wrong. So I don't say that, the, I just say it's incomplete um, and it may need to be revisited. Uh, I don't think that's at variance with being a spiritual community and a spiritual individual and trying our best to know uh, how God wants to lead us. Um, yeah, Jen, sorry. Yeah. yeah, the topic of inspiration is, has always been a great interest to me and I found, you know, going through life as a sincere Christian that the Bible did not have all the answers as I was taught that it did. You know, very difficult times in the early young adult years. Uh, I found Alvin Thompson's book, The One, Two, and Ten, extremely helpful. Um, but those are broad principles. And um, what's fascinating me, I was just reading the story of Nicodemus. And here's Jesus. He's here on earth. And he could have explained all the mysteries to us. And he talked about wind. You can't see it. You know. Inspiration and here's God three. There's the idea of when you cannot see it. It's just something that we can't explain. We can experience it uh, and we feel it in our lives. But there are broad principles that are very important. And I want to say, just in, in closing on my comments here, that I had a very secure childhood. I am so glad that you know there were certainties in my childhood. As I've grown, of course, then I question some of those, but uh, openness, not rigidity, has become really important as I've grown. Also, I gave my son a very secure childhood, and then in his experience in the Christian education, he was exposed to more ideas than what I had told him. Sure. And he's a youth pastor now, but he's very secure, and yet very, you know, gener and liberal in his thinking. So I, I think there's something to, as, you know, when you look at the the children of our, you know, our children, our grandchildren, you know, I think there's something to security and certainty for young children. Sure, sure. I don't disagree with anything you said, Jim. Uh, I think the, the other thing to just sort of put in there is that I think we all understand that even in that, um, there is a recognition that at different stages of our life, we may need or react in different ways to different things as well. We need to capture that. Um, youth rebellion, for instance, is not necessarily rebellion, you know. Um, it is being under 19, you know, and you've got to learn how to capture that and so on. And sure, children. Uh, Roseanne spent her life teaching children in an elementary school. They would need things presented much more black and white. Uh, you and I don't need that, etc., etc. So even in that, there is these age-related uh, differences. Uh, Henry, thank you, Graham. <clears throat> I think to use the Ezekiel 10 uh, example, I wonder if part of what gives us confidence that that's inspired, or why we call it inspired, is not just that he says the word of the Lord came to me, but the fact that what he did with that was to go and speak against power and say things of an ethical and moral import that we value and resonate with. And I think that that's true in general for the prophets. They were basically speaking truth to power and oftentimes going, doing what was courageous and not expedient. 
And so when they said, God inspired me to do this, I, I, I wonder if we look at that, not just that word, but the, the, the whole picture sure. of, of, is that, is that is evidence for or against inspiration? Sure. Uh, that's compelling, isn't it? That the, um, it, it, it had a good explanation and it worked out and it fitted the frame of reference that we think is admirable and good. Um, of course, that I would sort of challenge you to think too of when people said that um, God told me to do this, um, you know, cleanse these people and put all these men, women and children to death, that that not so good outcome can also be sort of reflected on. Uh, I think if I can just go on, I think where one of the points you made was that there's some universal moral truth. How do you say that? Some moral Well, principles. I think the principles tend to be... Uh, well, I'm happy with the words universal and eternal even. Uh, we have to massage them, we have to keep working on them. You know, um, you, you know um, well, ad living is not my strong point here, but um, uh, treating women with, you know, uh, with respect 2,000 years ago has got a very different application than tre treating women with respect in 2017. And so, while the principle remains pretty steady, respect, the application is quite different. And I just, when I do my thinking, I like to say, all right, I, I think the principles are whole true. They, they're the ones worth uh, getting involved in. Autonomy and doing good and you know, whatever, whatever, whatever. Uh, but also, um, I, I may be forced to say, but this now is applied differently, or it has a different outcome when I apply it in a different context and in a different time. Thank you. If I can follow up just briefly, I think what I do, uh, right and wrong, I just think it's what I do, is if, if something that says the word of the Lord resonates with my moral principles, uh, then it's inspired. Uh, if it doesn't, then I think of another explanation. Good. No, I, I no, I think that's that's fair. Um, I would just I would encourage. I mean, all of us need to stay within the community because I think there's a lot of people out there who are um, uh, pretty convinced at the moment uh, about certain moral issues, and they get their quote uh, authority from the scripture that that you wouldn't be real happy with. So you need to wrestle with them as well. All right, one one more, and then we're done. A couple of weeks ago, a group of 14 theologians met at Andrews University under the title Sola Scriptura. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing they didn't invite you to be a part of their group. Uh, but I'm um, really qualified. But I'm Some of my other colleagues shouldn't have been there, that probably. I'm wondering what you would like to say to such a group. Sola Scriptura? Um, being an untrained theologian? Yeah. Um, I think that's a bit narrow. I mean, I know what the historical version says about that. Um, I think in reality, none of us do it that way. Um, I think all of us at some level take the scripture and say, how does this speak to me today? Um, and and we bring in other things to help inform us at, at some level. We get stuck on some biggies like LGBTQ stuff, but others, we, we're quite happy to do that. Um, none of us live in uh, family relationships, you know, sola scripture, like they did a couple of thousand years ago. We found that one all right to massage, but some others we stop at saying that's not any good. I better stop because Leo's looks ready to take over. He's <laughs> very good. Quick comment. Yes, sir. With respect to the authority of Scripture, you must never forget there's a human dimension to it as well as a divine. Yep. And keep those intentions. These inspired writers use the intellectual furniture of their time. Indeed. The scripture is historically conditioned, context specific. And the more you study it, you see in the flesh of the text, you see the, the historical conditionedness to these texts. I couldn't, the agree, couldn't agree more. That's why he wasn't in the media either. <laughs> Let's pray. Oh, no, our, our, little, our little benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up.
his countenance upon you and give you your peace.